Hi, I'm Aaron Sarofsky. And I'm Austin Shaw. This is Between the Keyframes. Episode 29, Interview with Sophie Lee. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Between the Keyframes. We are here with a very special guest, Sophie Lee. Hey, Sophie. Um, Sophie (laughs) is a super talented designer, motion designer, illustrator, art direction, storyboard art. Uh, Sophie is also one of my alums from when I taught at SCAD. And Sophie also did the cover of the second edition of the motion design, not the, getting my titles all mixed up, design for motion. And Aaron did the forward for this. So we got Cheers. this whole like full circle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the collective. Um, Sophie, you grad, what year did you graduate from SCAD? Um, I graduated in 2018 summer. Okay, so 2018, and then you went and worked at um, Odd Fellows in Portland, and you worked there for a couple years, right? Yeah, I think I was there for, I think it was like, I think I was in Portland for like two years and a half, but I actually worked for like a bit less than two years. Okay, that's right. And then you, you went freelance, and I know you, right, kind of right before the pandemic, right? I know. Yeah. I mean, like, if I think about it, it's like, it's, it, it, I feel like it was like meant to be, you know? Um, right. Right. And you've been working as a freelancer since then. I know you've worked with Buck and other studios and other, other brands, right? And, uh, done some educational work as well. And, uh, yeah, well, I mean, today's going to be a fun episode because we're going to get to know Sophie a little more, but Sophie's also gonna, gonna ask Erin some questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's dig in. Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about your background, Sophie? Yeah, of course. Um, so I was born and raised in South Korea and then, um, I, uh, and then like I, luckily I was like, I grown up, I was grown up in an environment that, uh, it was like pretty artistic. Like my dad, he also wanted to be a painter and artist. But by the time, like it wasn't that value, like, pe- um, like my grandfather didn't think he would make a living out of it. Um, so, um, he was like still seeing the house and then like would draw with me all the time. So like, if I look back my childhood, I feel like, I feel somewhat like very privileged and um, yeah, very thankful. And so like, as I grown up, um, I've like, it was kind of like natural for me that, oh, I wanna do something creative. Um, but then like when I was a teenager, like I was like pretty lost. Like I didn't know what to pursue and didn't know what to um, go after. And so I, um, I went to Canada, Vancouver to study English and, um, meet new culture and, you know, and then, um, I was there for, for a bit and then like I moved to LA where I study graphic design. Um, and then it was just like a community college, like two years of community college. And honestly, I didn't really expect much and was just like looking for a job after that. Um, and something that maybe like working for street fashion, because that was something I was interested in and never thought that I would make a living out of doing animation. Like though, like I really loved animation and, you know, um, but then like I like met like really awesome professors and my colleagues and they were the ones like kind of like put fire in my like creative endeavor like and it, it was just like really awesome and I'm like still in touch with a lot of them and then they're doing really well so um and then like we were like okay we're at the community college and then some of my friends like started to transfer to other university um to study more and so uh, one of my professors at, at the college like she actually recommended me to go to SCAD and like apply and then I Unfortunately, I got, um, scholarship and then, um, 
I transferred as a graphic design major, but I felt like I was looking for something more that kind of like connecting some of the lost thoughts that I was like seeking for, you know? Um, and so I, uh, I, I think I had a meeting with John Collette for two hours and a half. Yeah, two hours and a half. And then like, I was like so convinced to, uh, transfer to motion media, uh, design department. And then, yeah. And then I, I guess like my creative voice and then the love, like all started from there, you know? Um, so you started at SCAD in graphic design and then how long were you at, how long were you studying graphic design at SCAD before you switched to the motion media department? Um, I think for a year. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and that's cool I, that, that you met with John. What were some of the other things that you felt like, whoa, I got to be over. I got to be in, in motion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was like working at Monty like really late. And then I guess like a group of students, they were working on a title sequence for commotion. Um, but I had no idea, like, I was like, wow, that looks like graphic design, but they're like moving in a really cool way, you know, um, like, um, depth and, you know, like really yeah. crazy animation and then colors and everything and then music all together. So I like walked up to them, like, Hey, like, if you don't mind ask me, like asking, like, what is, what is this about? And they're like, Oh, this is for like a title sequence for commotion. Um, so that was like before I switched my major. Um, yeah, I think that really yeah. triggered me. Yeah. Well, a couple, couple follow ups. Anna Claire, like one, what were you doing at Monty? And then also for the listeners who don't know what Monty is. So Mo Montgomery Hall, that is the, uh, digital media building at, at the Savannah College of Art and Design. So basically it's this, Factory. I think it was like a, it's a 60,000 square foot factory that the university purchased and turned into the digital media building. So it has motion media, animation major, uh, visual effects, and then uh, interactive and game design. So I know this quite well because I, I spent 10 years teaching in that building. But um, so just some clarification what that is. But yeah, what were you doing in Monty as a graphic designer? As a graphic design student. Yeah. Um, so the graphic design department building was like in down near the downtown, yeah. I think. Right. Yeah. But I was like living in Montgomery dorm. Got it. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so it was literally right in front of my dorm. So you can go so and do work. Okay. So basically, yeah, it's some more insight to, to people checking this out who don't know SCAD. So. That building, Montgomery Hall, Monty for short, they basically made it almost like its own little campus because they built yes. dorms there and there's a dining hall. So you were living in the dorms there. So that made sense that you would work, do your homework in Monty. And this sort of brings, I think, Erin, like this idea full circle that, you know, the, at, at SCAD, right? The, the motion media design department it was in the school of digital media. Graphic design was in a whole nother college, right? Yeah. In the university, it was in the school of communi communication and in a whole nother location. So, you know, that's, that's something that Aaron and I have been kicking around is, is building this bridge between traditional graphic design and, and motion. And, and, uh, anyway. Yeah. I also think like as you tell the story, I can't help but think about people that went to school during the pandemic. Well, so much of going to college for me was not so much the experience I had in my major. It was adjacent. You know what I mean? It was like I was in the school of design, but the photography school was like right there. And so I took photography classes and I hung out with photographers and that influenced my work so much so that when I look back on it and I think I, like when I think about my work, I think like, oh, it wasn't that special. Like what did people see in it? But now when I look back at the work, I'm like, Oh, it had a photographic quality. So even though I was working with lines and type and all the stuff, I would add grain and vignettes and do all this kind of stuff to it that made all of my work feel filmed. You know what I mean? And that's all the stuff I learned in those photography classes. So I think, you know, and, and then there was, of course, like the programming aspect and understanding not just 
um, how to make things look good, but like why they look good. You know what I mean? Like there was things, you know, uh, of like not just how to make a thing, but like really how to make a thing. Um, and so I just, I wonder about, you know, when, when you go to school, like you go to school thinking, you know, but while you're there, you learn, you learn so much more than you thought you did. I mean, think about like the transformation that happens when you graduate high school to when you're finishing your, your career in college. And that's not something like, it's hard to like tell somebody that those years of transformation from like a personal and a professional and the skill set gathering are so substantive, but you know, if you opportunities for synchronicity to happen. Yeah. And it's just, you know, I do believe a lot can happen like work from home and online. I think that there are efficiencies there, but I think there's something missing also when you're not, with people in person. Right. Yeah. The, the, ch- the chance encounters and said, yeah. what is that? And like, if, if you were, and they told you, and they told <laughs> you and obviously welcomed you into their community, you know, uh, that's like a beautiful, inspiring story. And like, and you, the way you found your way to it was going to Vancouver then and, and getting a grasp of the language and then going to a community college in California and being like, Hey, I kind of like this. And then a professor seeing something in you and saying like, you should look into this. And then, yeah, I just think like so many things led you to, to where you need to be. And I just like wonder if that, if that, and maybe it is, but maybe it's not that it would be possible to do without showing up and being in the presence of people. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, if I were to like look back and then kind of like see where it all started, like it was like I I I must confess that it was like a group of people that I was like hanging out with, you know, like when I was like hanging out in LA, like uh the people that I was hanging out with, they were like really into skateboarding, you know? And then like I'm also like a huge fan of vans. So like it was like so nat- natural for me to like love the street fashion and then all the, you know, like California and like sunlight and then the chill and, you know, and then I moved to SCAD and then I was like hanging out at Montgomery Monty all the time. And in that building, they had VFX, animation, um, motion media design. Like, so those are the group of people that I would like hanging out all the time, you know, um, and then like. I mean, like things have changed a lot, but like when I was in my high school or like in the middle school in South Korea, when I say to my friends, like, oh, I love animation, like that's like instantly like, oh, you're a nerd. You know what I mean? And that's not a, that's not like the best, like a uh, compliment to, to female students. Yeah. And so I think I would like hide a little bit and only talk to people like student or I mean, my friends who are interested in animation, you know, but then like when I went to SCAD and hang out at Monty, like that's literally, (laughs) you know, the stuff that we would talk about it all the time. So totally. Yeah. You talked about your dad being creative. Has that been a place that you've connected with him on? Um, Yeah. So. Yeah, I think, I, I think my dad, uh, often like expressed that, oh, I wish I had pursued like creative path. Um, and then like he actually like, he was, I, yeah, he loved like writing a song or like singing a song and loved like drawing and then painting. Um, and then he told me that that was like one of the way to like express himself. Um, which I think it was like naturally passed on me. Um, so I think I was like, I think, my parents are like very supportive um, of me like pursuing the creative path and then um, they've been a huge influence and and yeah cool was that your question yeah 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 I was just I'm always curious about that you know that that's yeah absolutely um well I know Austin just like I think we all have um because you come from a family with like a photography background and yep. 
the art. So like they were already earning very good livings in creative. Right. I think for most cultures, um, it's that is considered a luxury that people can't, uh, you can't afford to go do this. You got to, right. but you know, yeah, I know, it doesn't seem like a viable career yeah. path. Right. And like, unless you know somebody in it or you yourself have family in it, it's, it doesn't seem like. Realistic. Yeah. Realistic. I <laughs> yeah, know. When I no, absolutely. To, yeah. When I went to college to study design, my parents like kind of had a conversation behind my back and it was kind of like, well, we're going to be supporting her forever, <laughs> you know? And I think there's that thought in people's head and they sent me to RIT and spent a pretty penny to do so. I'm, sh I'm sure I got some financial, some like small scholarships and stuff, but by and large, like I think they, they paid it. <laughs> It wasn't me that paid it, it was them. So, you know, I can only imagine what they're, how they're feeling and thinking if they feel like I'm studying and spending all of this money at a private school, only to think that somehow they're going to have to continue to support me after that I've, you know. Little, did, little did they know. <laughs> no, I know, but little did they know, like there's so much, you know, um, money to be made as as an artist, you know, and whether even in like arts that are crafts, like there's, there's a lot of opportunity, you know, Absolutely. there is a lot of opportunity for handcrafted people are, that's a big, that's a big thing, you know? Anyway. No, I think for me, having grown up in, in a family of kind of creative professionals and, and not only like, you know, my father, my grandfather, right. It would yeah, generations exactly. of it. So in my mom and and so it's it was very normal for me but and then working with a lot of students who maybe come from it sounds like for sophie you're kind of in the middle you know somebody like there's this appreciation or but and now you're kind of getting to live that out which i think is yeah. super cool or then there are some students who are just like they're going against the grain where against it's just like Either. no support it's like they're out there just like no i believe i can do this and and mm -hmm. so it's always it's to me it's it's always an interesting um i guess origin story from people but there was one other question i wanted to just ask about that transition from graphic design to motion mm -hmm. and just yeah like so what was what was the big for you what was that selling point where you were studying you studied graphic design in in um community college you studied it for a year at scad but then you made this decision to switch so what was it what made you want to want to change your major yeah yeah um so i think the biggest selling point was that when i was like working i mean like i did some internship at a college and then i was like working as a freelance graphic designer um i kind of felt like uh, graphic design is like is is for business you know, like, um, I didn't know how to create, um, and the using the method of graphic design to express how I feel or like telling my own story, you know? Um, and it was just like very like branding oriented and then business oriented, you know? Um, and then like the assets that I would like play with in my work is, was already built by an illustrator or like created by another typographer. So I, wanted something more to tell deeper story so then like i saw the like a you know like the title sequence commotion you know like there was like definitely like a you know like a storytelling like something starts and then that and then ends in this and then deliver the really strong message but using a lot more powerful elements you know sometimes they even create the assets you know, like in Cinema 4D or, or Illustrator, you know, it's not just like, um, like a shapes or typography, like they actually use the composition using the shapes. And it was just like a lot more fun. And then for me, it felt like, um, kind of like liberating, um, my creative idea to tell yeah. different ways uh, to convey the story, if that makes sense. Yeah, narrative. You get yeah. to tell the story. And, uh, you know, it is interesting how 
in motion design, like we really do create a lot of stuff from scratch. I think people don't really realize, like, you know, like certainly we do, we can use stock things and things like that, but like by and large, a lot of what you see, like we literally start with nothing <laughs> and have to make a story, some kind of narrative, communicate some kind of message. Yeah, totally. And then we can also use music, you know, that which like really accelerates mm -hmm. the whole, you know, project. So yeah, it was just like, once I saw it, it was like kind of impossible to go back from where I was, you know. Right on, right on. And then when you made you made your transition from uh, being a student to being a professional. How is the professional world different than you expected? Yeah, especially going from school in a place like SCAD, where everything is so, I don't know, I want to say gray and rosy. <laughs> and, you know, you have skilled professors and um, everything is kind of like a yes and, you know, so. Yeah. Um, I think I was like pretty terrified at school because I knew how much support I was getting. Okay. You know, like I had friends to talk to who completely understand what I do and basically like share the sorrow or like, a, you know, like a hardship that we went through all together. Yeah. And then like the professors that I could literally just like, reach out through email and then, you know, can, can I get your support or like, what do you think about this? So like, I was like pretty terrified before I graduated. Um, so then, um, but like back to your question, I think, ooh, I, one of the things was like, oh, learning is endless. Yeah. <laughs> I really thought I was like ready before I graduated SCAD because like, oh, I learned this and that and that. I'm going to be working at Alt Fellows, you know? So I feel like, okay, like vacation mode is on, you know, because SCAD was like so yeah. tough to survive. So I really thought, wow, all the hard stuff is, is over. And I'm like, now I'm going to be having fun creating yeah. and, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, like doing my hobbies and, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so I think like one of the things that was like different was like, oh, learning is endless. And another thing was like, kind of like extension from learning is like endless um, that I only knew how to create, but I felt like I was really behind of like growing as an adult, you know, like I was pretty lost how to behave myself. Um, and I was pretty lost how to, you know, like, like it was like, just like really like, um, chaotic for me, like, because, oh, I'm like a daughter of my mom and, oh, I am a designer at Alt Fellows, but I'm also, um, friends of my friend, you know, like all these roles started to like really confusing me. Mm -hmm. So like that was like a little bit, um, different than what I imagined, you know, because I really thought I was prepared for, for, for the next chapter, but just like so much to catch up and so much to learn. Um, and then the, and then the last thing would be like, people are like really serious about the job. Like it's not a joke, but at the same time, there was a room for me to make mistake because people were still really generous and caring. Um, yeah. Well, oh God, what you said is so thoughtful and <laughs> lovely. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just so beautiful. Um, oh, thank you. I think people are going to really connect with that. It's so interesting as a studio owner when we go to hire people. Um, it's so interesting because you, when you see a candidate, a young or or even older, but just coming out of school, thinking like they got this. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to be like, and of course I can never say this, but I can say this here and maybe people will listen and know I'm thinking it, um, is I know you have this beautiful portfolio that you, and you accomplish so much in school, but you're just getting started. Like right. for me, like I know you don't know 
anything. And I'm just hoping <laughs> <laughs> that you're teachable, you know, because a lot of what happens in school, because it's a yes and, um, the world is a no but. You know, um, school is yes and, the world is no but. And what I mean by that is like, you know, in school you can make decisions and people are just giving you suggestions and like telling you how great it is because of course it is great. But in the world, once you show the work, even if it's the most brilliant thing, if the client still has time and money, they're going to give you feedback. And any kind of feedback comes off as a no. <laughs> um, often there's a, but it's beautiful and we love it and we appreciate everything you put in, but it's, but it's also like, okay, well, can you explore this? And what if the character did something more like this? And what if we lose this shot? that incidentally you spent two weeks animating right and move and do put that over there and so there's so that's that's why i say like the world doesn't know but and so it takes a lot of like strength and courage every day to come in to all of those no buts you know um and as you grow into um yourself as an artist an animator and like you say as a person you learn they're not, they're not so much no buts as that's just part of the job. You know what I mean? There's no other way to give feedback other than to say, change everything again and again and again until it's, until it's not going to get changed anymore. Um, and then, you know, as you get more experience and you do it over and over and over again, you start to see themes and trends for what those, ch you know, changes are and why there might be changes. So you start to kind of grow into um, as you're working on something, maybe I should give a version like this just in case. Like you start to get that intuition of like, maybe when they said make the logo bigger, it was actually that they can't see the logo because the background's so busy. Maybe that's what's going on. And you can start to make these decisions because the experience matters and it adds up. And if you're thoughtful and mindful, as you're living through the experience, that means that you're going to get to the result faster with less nose, you know? Uh, and as for the other side of it, you're right. I mean, coming out of school, you're providing for yourself, you're looking for a place to live, you're learning probably about car insurance and health insurance and very, very adult Renters things. insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which I highly recommend renter's insurance. <laughs> if you lose your laptop anywhere in the world, you get your money, you know, <laughs> like things like well, that. Well, yeah, renter's insurance, <laughs> like it covers all your personal property, even if you're traveling. Yeah. Stolen bike. The whole, this, whole con this part of the conversation is making me think of this idea of, of asymmetrical development, that life is often that, right? That we yes. might, you know, maybe you're excelling in one area, but there are other areas where it's like, well, I got to catch up a little and, and vice versa, right? It's interesting. Well, um, there were me, two, what's oh, that? Sorry. I was just going to say that was making me think, like if I'm achieving at work, it's kind of like that devil wears Prada thing, then you're failing at home. You know what I mean? Like everything can have all of you all at once, you know? So, mm. and there are ways <laughs> to maybe not fail at home, but if you are giving something like most of your energy, that means that this other, these other some things in your life are not getting it. And there's just no way of controlling that. Yeah. Sorry, Austin, I cut you off. Oh, no worries. No worries. I was going to say I have, I have two more things and then we could transition to Sophie asking Aaron questions. Uh, one is this observation. So this story, because I didn't know that anecdote about how you were hanging out in Monty before you were in the major and that you saw these students working on the commotion titles and you asked them, because I, but I do know that a couple or a year or two later, the way the commotion titles worked is the students would pitch. And then whoever won the pitch in would would become the kind of the director, the art director, creative lead. And that Sophie had 
won the the lead for when you were a senior and you got to lead and be the creative wow. director on that project. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember at that point, it had gotten pretty professional. There'd be like 20, 30 students like working on the, it was a production. So Sophie, and, and I think you had some other co co-leads but you were really the design lead on that, that year's uh, titles for commotion. So that's kind of neat, that full circle. Just wanted to observe on that. And then the other thing is that Sophie being an OG uh, design for motion alum, right? And, and a bit, and I, and it's, it's always good. You always encourage me to like, you know, keep, keep pushing and keep developing and keep teaching that class. And just, I don't know if just any thoughts that you wanted to share or experiences about, you know, design for motion, what it means for you. And yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I mean, like I fell in love with social media design, but in reality, like I was already junior, you know, and I was about to graduate within like a year and three months. So I really had little time to you know put my portfolios and learn all these like animation techniques and um design for motion you know so like there is a one moment that i almost going back to graphic design because i was like there's just like no way that i can learn all this like after effect animation or frame by frame and know how to draw storyboards and it was just like really overwhelming like because like I'm not coming from animation background like even the terms were like so like alien for me you know so but then like my friends were like yeah so be like have you taken a class like design for motion you know like you don't have to animate and I was like oh that's great because I love designing for motion and for animation you know like I was like um because like I, it's not like I'm like fresh out of like high school. I knew what I, what my strength was, what, what I was interested in. So I took the classes and it was kind of like, like a third eye opening, you know, like, uh, well, like, well, like one is like, okay, I can maybe get a job just being a designer in our industry. And two was like, it was like a totally different creative process, um, like designing for motion, you know, and then um, it was just so much creative thinking, so much concepting, and based on that, like doing uh, textile and illustrative, typography driven, or like matte painting. We did it, we did it like the matte painting, right? One of of the assignment. So it was just like a, a lot to like explore and kind of like find my own voice, like what is my strength? And at the same time, what is my weaknesses? So, um, I always tell Shaw that because I've gotten so much out of that class, like genuinely, um, and I still follow that process these days. So I still like tell Shaw, like, you should keep teaching that class. I'm sure so many students would appreciate it, you know? Yeah. That's amazing. Well, you know, it's so interesting. Like, I think people look at what we go and look at what we do and they go, wow, where do you even start? right you know and it's like well read the book it's right there take class yeah you know and that's how we would that's like a process that was I think you did a great job of just like getting it down and building a class around what we actually did in the world Mm -hmm. like so it wasn't something made up outside of the context of like work it it actually happened at work to create a process. Cause I think what people also don't realize is that we have to kind of bring the client along with us on all stages of the process. Like here are some ideas, here's what it could look like. Here's a little test of how it can move. And you basically just like work on getting buy-in at each kind of step of the process. And you know, what that kind of process saw that you outlined that's so great is that it, it is a process. We start with mind mapping. We start with coming up with keywords, like, which is great because then you're setting up a paradigm for success. So when you create a frame, it could be the most beautiful frame. But if I check it against that word list, well, does it fail or pass? Okay. Well, it fails because I'm not seeing that it's a spy thriller. It feels more like a comedy. Okay. Well, we're starting over. You failed the test. So that's what I love about 
that it is a clear process that you can constantly check back on. And then when you eventually have beautiful frames and you, you go to animate them, when you go to animate them, like, does it still look like my frames? Is it, and then when you're adding cadence and pacing, well, does it feel funny? Cause it's supposed to feel kinetic and you know what I mean? So like, why is it boinging? You know, again, you're constantly checking it back against, you know, all of this stuff that you did earlier in the process. And you're not just jumping into animating something that you don't So it all have. comes back to, to the brief. Does it, yeah, does it brief. serve the brief? Yeah. Does it answer the brief? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right on. Well, unless you've got any other background questions for Sophie, Erin, um, no, do mean, you have any other? Well, we wrote them all down. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I mean, I think we hit them pretty, pretty good. But, you know, okay, cool. So, um, all right. At this point, we're going to transition this to Sophie, okay. kind of taking on the role of interviewer for Erin and really, really to, to dig into some questions about uh, – what it what it's like being a female creative in in this industry? Okay, so Erin, I think um, growing careers and just like life in general, I think it's like piles of making decisions. And sometimes because I haven't experienced or I've never experienced about things that I tend to like hesitate or like kind of like step back. Um, so like. Do you have any advice about like making decisions both in career and life general? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Decisions, I think, I think you just have to make them. I once had a lawyer say to me, not making a decision is a decision. And that's like haunted me ever since. Like you can make a bad decision and that's okay. Um, You'll learn from it. You can make a good decision, but nothing comes of just being stalled, you know, of just being stalled. At a certain point, you do some research, you get a feel for what might feel right, and you go. And it, you, you just kind of got to live with, with the consequences of it and just know that whatever the consequences are, they will be better than have been sitting in that kind of paralyzed non-decision moment. Because again, yeah, making, no decision is a decision. It's it's literally choosing nothing, which is horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah. So, yeah, I just I just think like, yeah, only good can come from like being decisive and being thoughtful. And I it's interesting because being a director, like when you're a live action director, and even when you're a studio owner, I always just say I'm like the decider. That's basically my job is to make the decisions and then deal with the consequences of them. And sometimes those consequences are good and I get to show cool work and like, you know, look at this thing I made. And sometimes the consequences are terrible and I have to, I have to be the one that bears the burden of them. But, um, but it, at least something happens so that everything can move forward and we can, you know, just keep on. Keep on keeping on. Yeah. Yeah. That is a really good advice. And I think it's going to be lingering with me a little bit. Yeah. Like not making decision is like actually the worst decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. then like if you think about it, like even if I make like a bad decision, I'm only going to learn from it and make sure I don't choose that next time. Right. Yes. Yes. Again, it's like to your original point, like one of the first things you said about your job is you like realize that like, oh my God, the learning is just beginning. Mm -hmm. Like you cannot prevent things from happening. Good things, bad things. You cannot prevent it. Like you could just kind of be like open to learning. <laughs> <laughs> and and so it, it's one of those things like if if there is a decision in front of you i'm not saying to jump wildly into a decision because you have to make a decision think about it ask people do the proper research be mindful then just do it just make the decision it's a hard call often but you know like there's there was a, a couple of weeks ago we had three amazing jobs 
that were bidding. Three amazing jobs. We could not take all three. We wanted to take two so that we knew that we could focus and do a good job. But these are three jobs that like anybody in this industry would have died to be on. Like they were that good. And so we got on, I got on a call with my creative directors and my EP and my head of production. And I said, okay, it is decision time because sometimes like I want the input of other people. We have to make decisions. And at the end of this conversation, we are deciding to chase two and let go of one. That is, I had to make that decision. You know, I was just ultimately deciding that one of these were, we're not pursuing. And let's talk and figure out which two we are and which one we're not. And man, it was like, but this is so great for this reason. And this is so great for that reason. And that, 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 that. And at the end of it, after like a long hour of like, just talking it to death, there was a decision and it sucked. It sucked. Like no matter what it was going to suck, you know what I mean? But a decision was made. Was it the right decision? We will never know. We did wind up winning those other two jobs. So perhaps we would have won that job too. And then we would have been maybe over, over, or maybe if we were chasing a third one, we would have lost all of them because we were spread too thin to be picking three thin. jobs. So I think we made a good decision. Was it the exact right decision? Was it, I could have brought another creative director and built another team and spent all that money to like go after that job. You know, and this is spent a bunch more money to like, if we got it to do that, but like, it felt like the right, you know, decision to just chase two. And then it also then felt like the right decision to include my team, my key people in what we were going to chase and what we were going to let go of, you know? I, th I think another way to just another thought on this too, is like, when you make a decision, you're, you're a participant in the process and you're mm -hmm. participant in what is happening right? versus it happening to you, it happening to you. Right. Yeah. Now I think, I mean, also to clarify that idea too, is like not making like a decision to not make a decision is still maybe sometimes it's just like, it's a decision. Yeah. I don't have enough in information yeah. and, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to participate <laughs> and that's okay too. But just being aware that that's, that's the choice. Yeah, but if you're not making a decision, then it's happening. Then, then you're probably you. of the mindset yeah. that, oh, this is happening to me then. And, not and then you get bitter like, and resentful. But then yeah, but then you're not taking responsibility for the fact <laughs> right. that, well, you created an environment where, of course, it was going to happen to you. You took your own right. um, life choices out of it. In action. Yeah. yeah. So. What's the Bob Dylan? He, he who hesitates loss or is he who loses something like that no. bob dylan song i don't know i gotta look it up <laughs> yeah, you're talking about like, you guys are like bob who <laughs> yeah, go play. yeah. So yeah that was like such a good good um advice um yeah i need to now apply to my life it's very to challenging but then I swear every time I'm in a moment now where I'm like, oh, I got to decide and I don't know. Like just that example from the other day is like, okay, I can't just let it happen to me. We can't just pitch all three of these things. We have to decide. Like we have to make a decision. This is my decision. It's my company. I'm deciding. But like all the people that, should have a say, need to have a say in what it's going to be. And that's a way of like empowering people to be a part of the process, but also making sure that whatever the consequences of that are, I can own those because I, I don't want to lose all three of these amazing jobs, but I also don't want to work on all three of these amazing jobs all simultaneously mm -hmm. through the, a period of time where like everybody's going to want off because we're going into spring, summer. Yeah. Ha hashtag metacognition. <laughs> exactly. <We're> exactly. <laughs> Because we've all been there. We've been through like when it gets to be like a little extra, you know, and it's like, oh, I should learn for next time. Exactly what that is, Austin. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Self preservation. (laughs) Yeah. 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 What was a selling point for you when you were switching from like a set position to building like your own studio? I was um, living in New York. I had lived in Chicago working at Digital Kitchen. I was in their office there. And then I moved to New York, which is where I met Shaw in 06, 07, 08. And um, was doing, yeah, I was creative director for Superfad there. And I just missed Chicago. I miss the city. I miss my home here. I was here for six, seven years. I did not expect to love it, um, but I really, really missed it. And um, I knew I wanted to come back, but I knew I wanted to keep working at a design-led motion studio. And Chicago, with the exception of Digital Kitchen at that point, had been very post house driven. So you had places like film workers with vitamin and you had, um, I think flavor was around at cutters and you had these kind of designy offshoots within bigger, you know, post house centric things. And now at this point you have places like scholar, which is part of white house that are, I think pretty separate, but back then they were in the spaces of the other companies and they just felt like a little piece off of this bigger thing that was really making all the money. And I really wanted to, to work at a design led place. Like if somebody was calling it, they weren't calling to do some edits and some color correction and also throw some design in. It was, I would need the designer. Oh shit. And where are we going to color correct this? And do you have an editor? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was like, design led and so i knew to come back here i was gonna have to start a thing and um, my friend tracy bernard who was the rep for digital kitchen said she could get start getting me some work and that was that was like it it really you know there was an initial kind of partnership with two other partners that like fell apart within six eight months and we worked on like an easy mac commercial and a commercial for rotary international and you know, when you go from doing big Super Bowl spots and like Emmy winning main titles, you're just like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> like, is this really what I want to be doing? And the answer was, no, it wasn't what I wanted to be doing, but I knew it was where where I wanted to be doing it. And so after that, like partnership fell apart, which again, it was such a tiny little blip of my life. I was like kind of feeling broken and heartbroken for the first mm-hmm. time. Because I felt like, God, we were on to something. Why did you guys have to ruin this? Like, mm-hmm. like, yes, it was going slow, but it was also like 2007, 8, of course it's going to, 2008, of course it's going to go slow. We're in a fucking recession, you know? Um, we should be lucky we're getting any work at all. And so moving into 2009, which is when I started the studio officially, like January of 09. Um, it just started with like this phone call from a friend who's working at an agency and he was like, I got these spots. Do you want to work on them? And I was like, no, I don't have a company. I don't really know what's going on anymore. He goes, we'll make a new company. It was you that we wanted to work with anyway. Like you're the talent. And I was like, okay. (laughs) So I called my lawyer and my accountant and they were like, okay, go fill out this paperwork. And I, that's why it's called Swarovski is because, I didn't have time to figure anything else out. And we were still kind of in negotiation about how the other company was going to come apart or if it was going to come apart, but it was very clear. I was, I knew I wasn't working for it anymore. And um, they were like, well, if you name it your name, it'll be very clear that you're not working there. And I was like, okay, we can always change it later. It's just some paperwork. And so that's how it became my name, you know? And, um, Yeah, but it was, what was interesting is I know I own my own studio and it's my name on the door and I like get credit for everything. And there's like a lot of reasons for that. But like, I, I just wanted to be a a creative director, like a relevant creative director doing great work in design led projects. That was my goal. My goal was not to be a giant studio owner with like all the things and see my name and to be speaking everywhere on behalf of all that kind of extraneous stuff. It was to do the work. Like I wanted to do the work where I wanted to do it, like location wise. And that's why it came to be. 
That's really awesome. Um, I think I said it another day, but I think it's like really unique that you're like female studio owner in our industry where our industry is like kind of like still like male, um, dominant. So I think it is like really unique that, and I've been always like wanting to reach out to you and kind of like asking you advice in both like, you know, like you're making creative decision and then you're kind of a creative journey, uh, like how you, like where you started and then your mm-hmm. how you've been going, uh, went through some stuff and, um, also your mom and you have your, your family. So that's like, for me, that's like two really big things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have like much respect <laughs> knowing yeah. that, like, just, yeah, just like be good at one thing is like even hard for me, you know, <laughs> Not good at yeah. I'm just mildly good at something. <laughs> and then I hire good people. Yeah. I trust them to do their work too. That's another thing. I think for me, I, there was a point at which I realized where I get better when I hire well thoughtfully you know and and it's not that i i think also when you move from hiring who you who who you think you should hire to who you want to hire Mm -hmm. that there's a big difference there yeah yeah totally i'm sure there's like a lot more to like actually run the studio you know yeah it's Um, a whole separate side yeah but yeah it's not like all of a sudden I went from being that person that wanted to come back to Chicago to being the person I am now. And it's kind of like you going Mm -hmm. from, you know, school to, to then kind of starting at odd fellows and realizing like, Oh gosh, I thought I knew what the hell was going on. Um, What you realize is, is um, when you're at the table, you're at the table for a reason. You've got just enough experience to get you there and then you have the opportunity to listen and learn and then to kind of keep growing and elevating within that so I feel like you know I can look back and provide insights on like what I did and didn't do right um but at the same time like everybody's going to go through their own journey I think the key to your initial point is that just you never stop learning if I, whenever I've come to that place of my hands down on the table saying, but I know that mm-hmm. is fine that you do not know that you just being closed minded and the more it hurts or the more like yelly I get or feel or dramatic I feel about it, the more wrong I often am. And I just have to like move through that, breathe through it, accept it. And then just listen to what people are saying around me, you know, and to create space for that. Like I wanted to come back to work. I was like, all these people are wrong. Everybody needs to come back to work. You know, like why would they want to be home all the time? That's crazy. (laughs) And I was like really like frustrated and pissed off about it. And then, then I was like, well, you know, Mondays and Fridays at home was kind of (laughs) nice. You know, like maybe there's compromise in here. Maybe like I should listen and hear and people's lives did change a lot, including my own. Like I was obstinate to the point where I didn't realize that there were changes that were made already through the pandemic that affected my life in a better way. (laughs) Like, but, but I, I mean, part of my rationale for it was just, I missed people so much. Like I missed laughing all day long at work. I missed laughing. I missed like, there's people that we hired over the pandemic that like, I barely have been in the same room with still to this point. You know what I mean? And to me, I'm just like, that personal connection is so, so important to me. But it also, that doesn't mean that it is for everybody else, you know? Mm -hmm. So, So that's just like what I have to work through. And kind of find a balance for, but, but to the initial point of that, something like I've really had to learn and walk through and to really think about, um, and process and come to a different decision on and to know that whatever that decision is in six months, I could feel differently. And so could everybody else. And that's okay.
Yeah. What was the point where you felt like I'm like ready to have my own family and then、uh, make a little person? I hope it's not like getting too personal, but like, no, oh, like I, I yeah, like you know, because、mm-hmm. that's like completely new chapter for me, right? Yeah. Well, I think like probably a lot of women like me, we ask our doctor how many eggs we got left. <laughs> What kind of rum? <laughs> you know what I mean. And I was, and you know, I、uh, definitely was talking to my doctor, and they were like, "Well, you're getting old." Yeah, I think I was what, like, I must have been thirty eight or thirty seven at the time, and they were like, "You, you know, got to start thinking. You maybe have a couple of years left, but you got to start thinking about freezing some eggs or." Better yet, freezing some embryos, which are fertilized eggs. I hope everybody knows that, but just in case they don't,、um, and like to fertilize an egg, there needs to be like a man. <laughs> and I was like, oh shit, I don't have that <laughs> either. <laughs> and I, you know, and I'm like, you know, I was very happy not having, like, not really being in a relationship. I felt so much freedom. Not like I don't know. I just always felt like, even though maybe that my parents' dynamic didn't mimic this, but I always felt like they would get a say or get a say in a way that is、uh, invalidate my say, right? Like、um, in a way. So,、um, but it was really weird as I was kind of going through that. I did meet Kevin, and. It was a really interesting thing because I'm like meeting this guy at this moment where I'm like going through this physicality thing and thinking about my future and if I want to have kids. And he was five years younger, so I'm sure he wasn't thinking about that at all.、Um, in fact, I know he wasn't. And、um, I just, you know, you know, we were talking about like moving in together, and I was just like, so here's the thing. And you know that definitely accelerated our relationship very, very quickly. And、um, whether that's healthy or unhealthy, it happened. <laughs> and he was like, "Well, I do want to be a dad." And I, you know,、um, I I feel like in some ways, like we didn't really have time to really spend with each other before all that. So you know, for Kevin and I, it was like really. A, a little early in our relationship to be talking about it, but I definitely had to talk about it because it was something I was going through. We were talking about moving in together, and so that definitely accelerated things, maybe sh- more than it should have.、Um, but whatever it should or shouldn't have, it it did it it accelerated things, and we were like, okay, before before we even think about like getting married, let's see what happens. <laughs> like maybe we'll get pregnant, maybe we won't get pregnant, and then. You know,、um, but we did, we did get pregnant, and then actually we miscarried, and and then I didn't realize it because when you miscarry, you your body's all fucking fucked up and out of whack, and you know you don't really know what's going on, and so I didn't realize it. But on my next cycle, I had gotten pregnant, <laughs> and so whereas with the first one, we knew like so quickly on the. On the second one, and what became Rocket, like Rocky,、um, we didn't know until like there was a heartbeat and all the things. So in a way, it was a blessing because I would have just been so nervous the whole time. And then I was like, you know, I think something's weird. You know, I haven't got my period and like all the things. So I, you know, took a home test and was pregnant. And so then I scheduled like an immediate、um, visit with the doctor, and she's like, yeah. <laughs> Let's do like all the things that we're supposed to do. So it was, uh, but apparently after you miscarry, you're very fertile. So、mm. that may be your body's way of making it up to you.、Uh, and uh, and you know, it was a good pregnancy. I did get very sick after. I um, it was just I lost a lot of blood and yada yada yada. That's also something like I had a very healthy pregnancy, um, but I wasn't. I I've, I've never just been sick. Like that, and and I was so grateful、uh, to my team here because even though I was here and showing up, like you don't realize how tired you are, how deficient you are, and like my creative directors really kicked ass, and they took, they didn't 
need to be asked to take responsibility, they took it. And my executive producer, nobody said, Aaron, you're not up to snuff, like, just go home. They're like, no, hang out, like, get your cup filled by us. But like, we're going to just take care of it. <laughs> they just took care of everything. And that's, that's what I mean. Like, you know, if you choose who you think you should have versus who you want to have, that's the difference in the team. That's the people you want around you. And they really kind of helped me through like what was like a challenging time. It took like six, eight months for me to feel better. And, and like, once I felt better, I was like, Oh my God, how, what just happened? And Steven was just, who's my managing director, executive producer. He's like, Oh yeah, you were in bad shape. We just dealt with everything. We just, and it was, you know, incredible. And that's what I talk about when I talk about like when you're building your network as a, a junior artist and meeting collaborators and in school and building your network, like all of those people later in life, because everybody will have something. Everybody will get sick. Everybody will have a death in their family. Everybody will experience something in their life that is not pleasant and they need support. That is you know, you being there for other people and like building that network is why you do that. Not just to enrich your life, but so that when you need to be carried, they carry you for a little while. You know, that's really, really, really important and a really valuable part of being at a staff position in a full-time job in a place that you feel validated and appreciated and you have co-workers. I always say like, God, don't go be a one person at a single at a company. You know what I mean? Especially starting your job, go work with many people, meet a bunch of people. Cause when that, this one goes and works over there in 10 years, and when this one moves on in 20 years, they're all going to be your future collaborators and your future boss and your future client. And, da, 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 and you know, it's like, they're going to hire you, you're going to hire them. So if you, if you limit your exposure earlier in your career, that network is vastly diminished. Um, that's like really great point. And that is something that I actually learned a lot during my freelance life because when I was a scared, um, like I had like friends all the time, you know, I had people everywhere. And then when I went to art fellows, like, um, you know, like I had teams and everything. And then when I moved back to South Korea, I was like, like in terms of like work wise, like I was getting more opportunities and responsibilities, um, which I, that's what I was exactly looking for. But at the same time, like I really missed the community, you know? Um, and then, you know, like it's, it's like when you actually have it, you don't see like how much yes. you have it. And then once you don't have it, like you see the value of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and then like I, I saw, the episode that you guys did with Justin Cohen. And then yeah. um, I remember him saying that, um, like, these are the people, like, the people who are, like, you know, in the career, like, these are the people that you're, you know, you're going to grow all together, you know, like, you're going to be working with these people, like, you know. Yeah. And I was like, that is so true, you know. And then, like, I feel like, when I just like graduated SCAD, like I got, I feel like I got earlier exposure. And, um, I think I definitely feel grateful that, oh, like, um, people like know my work, know my name, you know, but at the same time, like I wish I had that exposure when I was a bit older, you know, when I had a bit of experiences because there are certain things that, oh, I wish I had done differently or, you know. Um, so that is like so, so important, you know? So that is the thing that I wish I had known when I was at school, you know? Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things I always say to Shaw, like, God, if I were that age now listening to us, would I even like know what we're saying? <laughs> like, so I, I do think to a certain extent you have to experience it, you know what I mean? Ex experience it to know how important it is. You know, it's like mm -hmm. losing a sense and then it coming back, you know, if you like, like when I had COVID, I lost my sense of taste. And then when it came back, I was like, oh, shit, I, <laughs> like, oh my God, well, well, you know, what was life before? Per perspective, yeah. right? Yeah. Pers there's only one way to get it. I mean, that's one thing I do. I do um, like to ask people, even 
I'll do it with like my seniors. Like I'll have a senior come and visit the class full of sophomores and I'll be like, Hey, what do you wish you knew two years ago? Right. Cause it is, it is that, that kind of perspective, but I, I think it is something that only happens or that you really appreciate it through having lived it. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I think I, 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 I still feel very appreciated that I knew this in my early 30, you know? So I was, I'm like, okay, well, let's compensate that. At least I know now, you know, and um, I value that. Um, and then I think like my another question is for both of you that because I, I'm, I'm like, I don't have kids or like more married. Do you think like that perspective has impacted your career? Were, were, were you able to see like new perspectives when like for Erin, like, giving direction to people because now that you have daughter like maybe um i don't know like some new perspective and shaw has two kids and um is that helpful when you're teaching students um what do you think shaw <laughs> i'm curious what you're gonna say well yeah i mean i was gonna say just from one one point and sort of this theme to it i mean it i don't know if the fact that like having you know a, a female children has influenced me to really try to advocate for the female students. Mm. I mean, I, I'd like to think I would anyway, <laughs> but I, I mean, yeah. it, it certainly, you know, when, when I'm working or trying to encourage female students in, in terms of their per career or professional, uh, preparation and learning how to negotiate and how to really navigate in a way that I don't know, like just, just, with their their male peers right that, that they yeah. want them to go out and and be able to succeed i mean there's definitely thinking about my own kids in the back of my head too right like hey i want i want you to go out in the world and make it an easier road for them in the future right like to be an yeah. example like that that that's true um in terms of just i think bigger pictures i mean it's it's probably softened me in a lot of ways having kids being a being a parent right um probably helped me to like kind of slow down and, and appreciate things um yeah yeah how much you Aaron? well it's interesting i i would love to say that like creatively it's inspired me or um something like on that side uh but i i would say i just as inspired <laughs> as I was before. Uh, if anything, I feel grateful that it hasn't diminished my desire to put create creative stuff in the world and to impact the world creatively. Um, the, the things that have changed about me is, is I have so much more empathy for people with children <laughs> because like you really can have absolutely no idea until it happens. And, um, like the the interesting thing is that you know because we have all collectively done our jobs for so long before and we're like experts at what we do but before we've had children i think that's going to be would be the case for you sophie and definitely the case for you austin when kids come along they're the new hard thing to figure out they're where the hard learning curve is so for me like being at work was like I can breathe. I know what I'm doing. I had more confidence. I could do it efficiently and quickly. That, that job is easy easy relative. Part. <laughs> and so, so, so the stuff at home became the hard new challenge. And so I, I began to like appreciate kind of how much I had put into my career and my work and to building this thing and building it well so that that I could focus a little bit extra on that and have it not make everything else fall apart, you know? Um, so I, I felt really good about that. I do think it's really cool that my little girl comes and sees me directing or sees her mama's name in big film titles and hears that I speak around the world. It's also like my husband stays home and I'm out working. I feel like so much pride in that whole flip flop of how it's supposed to be like, she doesn't know a world where mama's not boss. She doesn't like, she doesn't like for her, every woman is president and every guy stays home taking care of the kids. 
You know what I mean? Like, it's going to be surprising to her when she goes to her friend's house and it's the other way around. And I think that that, that's where and how change in the world happens, period. (laughs) Just show me, don't tell me, show me. And so I, I feel really great about like putting that out there and having her become like the second generation of that, you know what I mean? And not be, have to be the first generation of it. Um, and so that truly like where she goes with her life can become like an actual choice instead of a hopeful, instead of something that she has to like just fight to choose for. You know what I mean? I didn't say that very elegantly, but I think you know what I'm saying. It's like, yeah. I would add one other thing I think that having uh, my kids have have helped me with is just to try to to, to see the world a little more through their eyes, right? It's kind of brought me back to, to seeing like a kid, right? Where you can get excited about things. I mean, and it's, I mean, it, it, it's a tough balance because there's, there's the responsibilities and the, you know, the financial burden and, and planning and all, all that stuff. And that could get really stressful, but just to kind of be with them, you know, and I, that's something I learned too, is it's just like, especially when they were little, like, I think what they needed most was just my, me being present, right? Around, with my attention, around. my presence. Yeah. And, and when I was around to be, be there, you know, and, and, and in turn had a, being there with them was seeing things a little bit through their eyes and getting back to, um, I don't know, just things being fun and new and, 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 you know, it's, it's a brand new world. Well, you um, remember I what think you as they are, yeah. yeah, it connects you back to how you felt being like, exactly something to jog your memory about sitting on the floor six inches from the TV until you have your kid sitting on the floor right. in front of the TV. You know what I mean? Like there's, you know, there's nothing like that feeling in the world or, you know, to all of that, just like reading for the first time and counting. And, you know, you're just like, God, I remember that book when I was a kid and you're reading it to your kid and you're kind of imagining what they're imagining and then like seeing what their preferences are. I mean, it's really a special thing having a kid, but it is just shit ton of work. And it is a lot of unknown and Everything that could go right, things go wrong. And you have to be very patient and prepared, but also like open. You have to just be open. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like a lot of times my role is is I like to think of it as being a caretaker, right? I'm yeah. like guiding and, and I'm taking care, but it's like they're their own people. You know, my kids are, you know, actually they're now both teenagers now so yeah yeah the little one just turned 13 so it's like you know older one's going to be 15 uh and they're their own people right and and to let them be right and to let them that's been a big thing for me recently and and it's this idea of letting them figure it out for themselves at the same time i'm a caretaker so it's like okay i gotta have some guardrails but but letting them be who they are you know and in that in some ways with students, you know, it's kind of built in, you know, because my students, now my kids are not, you know, they're going to be this age of my students not too long from now. Right. But like with my students, like there's a fair amount of like, yeah, that's part of the process. I'm letting you figure it out. You mess up. That's fine. You like, just keep, you know, you pick, you pick yourself up and we figure it out. And to extend that, that kind of grace to my family of letting them figure it out is, that's kind of where I'm at in my life lesson at the moment, you know, yeah. and, and then I can really bring that back to myself. Like, Oh, I give myself permission to yeah. figure things out and not be perfect all the time. But yeah. yeah. I think one of the things that we don't often talk about, like, so we don't really talk about our kids a lot because they're seen as a liability. And I think in a, in an office, you don't want to be seen as a person that's always ducking out early for a kid or, you know what I mean? Um, and as a woman, if you talk about your kid all the time, it can get, I think you can get the eye rolls. But, um, the thing that we really don't talk about is aging parents. And the generation above us, like, this is a big thing. As you get into your, what, like your 40s and certainly your 50s, you are dealing with aging parents. And 
the toll that can take on a family and um it's it's an it's emotional it's financial there's often a lot of just drama in families around that um so uh, it those these are these are all real life things that like historically when you hit these stages of life they become real real things that you have to navigate. And again, that's why that network is important. That's why, you know, like the girlfriend network is important or the friend network is important. Hey, like what's going on? My mom has Alzheimer's or this is happening. Like, okay. Like the network ignites all the resources start coming your way. And it's, you know, that's an, it's an, an important part of like, um, life, you know, that's an important part totally. yeah and I think if I were to compare myself like the biggest change would be like when I was in my 20s life revolves around me you know like the world mm-hmm. like oh I can totally do it oh uh, like I am me super confident mm-hmm. but there's no base behind like you know and then like I hit 30 and then I don't know like I think one of the things that really changed my perspective was like I am part of the world. It's not like world is like revolved around me, you know? And then like, I, I see it differently when I look at my parents aging, you know, I see my brother differently. I see the people, the collaborators differently, you know? Um, so that's like so important. And, um, I, I, and I think that is why I, like, I really love our industry, you know, cause I think our industry has like really special, connection and then I really like the culture and then you know like how the culture is like passes along um so um yes that is why I I I think it's all really connected you know and then like the more I'm happier and then the more I'm like growing and mature like getting mature I think my work also like portrays that you know and then the way I communicate the way I collaborate with people is is also changing, you know, mm-hmm. um, like I try to be a better listener. Um, I try to really, um, like appreciate their time. So I try to be more efficient. So I think it is so all like very connected. Yeah. I think also like, as I've gotten older, I've erred on the side of clarity instead of worrying about sounding like a bitch or too direct. I, I think more comes from succinctness and directness than um making it flowery for like because i'm worried about offending somebody you know Mm -hmm. so that's another thing um so i think like who we are on the inside pretty much stays the same but like how we adapt in our work life definitely um comes with maturity and understanding like Oh, I was being way too complimentary because I did have a lot of feedback and now they don't really understand that that feedback is like important feedback. (laughs) It's not like a suggestion. It's like a mandate. And so that had to evolve my creative director style to be like, you know, okay, thank them for something, but then move into here are the notes and you follow up then with an email or a Slack or something with just as direct and short as possible what the actual notes are you know any questions so that there's no question that even though there were some compliments in there that it doesn't change necessarily the meaning of the exchange so that's hard that's that's hard to do because that has to do with self-awareness and also potentially coming across as like a jerk or a bitch or whatever word you want to use but I do think that directness is, um, it's good because it's, it's saving people's time. It's all the things you said. It comes out of, you know, working efficiently and being a good collaborator. Oh, I did the one thing I didn't say about having, I talked about like, you know, moving into having a, a daughter and how that came about because like of a certain age feeling kind of like, like forced essentially to make a decision. Um, about having kids because of how old I was and just like the biology of it. But the thing I didn't touch on with having, with actually having kids, having a child and a husband and the business and my clients and, you know, other family and responsibilities and friendships out there is that like there's only so much time in a day, 
<laughs> and um, it feels like everything always needs 100% of you, like all the time, but there is only 100% of you to give. So there are times where things just need more of you and then other things get less of you. And that's natural, but it's also important that you don't let that happen all the time. So like if, if, if I have a couple days where work is just annihilating me, I just make sure there's a couple days where I'm, I'm, that's how I balance. Like it's, it's like what needs my attention is getting my attention, but I do have to shift out of that mode. It can't be like that all the time, you know? And as a result, like if I can be finished at four and I could pop home and take my kid for ice cream in a movie, I'm going to do that. You know what I mean? Because I can, you know, and for me that the giving of my time and my presence and just being there is like, that's like all she wants. So if I like go out of my way to like, do that a few times, a few times where I'm late and things are kind of fucked up or I'm traveling for a week, it'll, that's what I'm hoping will balance out. So that is not like, oh, well, she was always gone. It's like, oh yeah, she was gone a lot. But then, you know, when she was around, she like made extra time for me and we did all these different special things. But what that does mean is I'm tired. <laughs> like when I go to bed, I just like go to bed hard. But I also know like she's five now. Like eventually she's going to be 13, 14, 15. And it'll, it'll hopefully still be like that where she wants me to be around. But like this, this period of time with her is so short. Like I can't let it squeak by, you know? I feel like that's parenthood. I don't remember the last time not feeling tired. I know. It's a good thing. I always say whatever somebody I know is pregnant, I'm like, just sleep. Just, just stay home for nine months of sleep. That is the only preparation you can possibly give yourself. Um, and the weird thing also about having kids is like when you have a child, they literally take everything from you. Like it starts with like your dignity with like how they come into the world, right? Like they take your dignity, they take your health, they take your energy. They're literally stealing vitamins and nutrients from your body. It's like a, you know, a parasite. And then they come into the world and they take your sleep and they take your money and they, they, they take your energy and they take everything. Right. And they literally, they'll die. If you don't attend to them, you feed them like you're holding them in one hand and, and then you're feeding them in the other. Right. But then there's a day where all of a sudden they're holding the bottle out of nowhere. They're just holding the bottle up and you have a hand and you get a hand and that is a big deal. You got a hand, you can, scratch your ass you could take a sip of your own coffee you could do a lot with this hand and then eventually they're sitting up and you're like oh my god they're sitting up like they give a little bit of of what they took back and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and then they give that smile and that little extra something that like ignites something in you that you're just like ooh, endorphin like crazy right and then more and more and more, they, you get more of yourself back. And I just like imagine like when she's 20 and I have all of myself back and I can say, okay, go do your thing. Like I'm going to go do my thing now too. You know what I mean? And I know it's not like a separation like that, but that's how I think of it. Like I just remember her coming into the world and feeling like a shell of a person. Like I, there was nothing of me left. And it was all here in this, this little thing that I put into the world. But then I got my hand back and I got my other arm back. And, you know, you know, the first time she ever slept through the night, which wasn't until she was like four, like I was like, she slept through the night. And like the moment she was like potty trained, and I was like, Oh, um, that was a big deal. That was yeah. A big one. That's like, Oof. and, and no like, more diapers. That was like, God. They, you get these like moments where you're just like got like Tom Brady when he was 20th, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, Super Bowl. And so I used to make the joke that the, yeah, yeah, that they're like vampires. I would make the joke. Yeah. It's like they suck your life force away. But, but now we're, we're like, 
you know, we play, we play Nintendo together. That's pretty fun. Yeah. Sometimes my kids will make me food. I'm like, oh, thanks. Appreciate <laughs> that. Or I'll be like, you know, I'll be working. Yeah. They'll come to the studio and I'll be like, uh, oh, do you think you can refill my water bottle? <laughs> and they'll do it. <laughs> it's amazing. Oh my God. This morning I like came to say good morning to Rocket because yesterday I just, I needed some time. <laughs> and so I Oh, and I was like, and I was laying with her and she was kind of getting up, walking around her room. And I was like, oh, I don't have my glasses. And she was like, be right back. And she went into my room and she got my glasses. And it was like, there she go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you get my phone? <laughs> Look, I'll send them to art class and they like make things. I love that. Right? Aww. It's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. No, so it's interesting. I did want to touch on that because like, you know, every day you feel like you want to be there doing that. And then when you're there, you're thinking about like, oh, I should be doing this other thing. And so like in the early days, you're really like, it's very hard. But, you know, what's also fun is like she'll come into the studio after school and she'll bop around and people will see me as like a real human being. Like I don't believe in like this work life separation thing to me is all one thing. Yes, and, yes, yes. And that is what it is. So um, I think people around here really kind of appreciate that. You know, it's not like she's here all the time and uh, there's like a screaming kid running around all the time. But it's nice that she flows into the office and I get to leave early with her. And, you know, there's she just like kind of gets it and she connects it all together. Um, and people here connect it all together and they kind of get it. Um, now I get it. Like I own a company that's a luxury because I could do what I want, but, um, other people bring their kids in too. Occasionally it's really nice when somebody has somebody pop by. Yeah. What would you advise to like female creatives, um, who are like in my position, like a bit senior and then kind of like, you know, transitioning from twenties to thirties? Mm -hmm. well so I think the biggest thing I learned at that point in my life was instead of asking to be something saying you're it because <laughs> usually like if you're a creative director you've already creative directed probably for a year or two you know what I mean like you've you've been naturally leading jobs offering feedback mentoring people so I would say like you know, if you're in a position where, you know, you are acting in that manner, like really, truly, cl like clearly, um, you have to ask for it. You have to, you, or just say like, I am a creative director. I need the title or I'm moving on to be a creative director officially and pay for it somewhere else. Now, the weird thing is, is when a person is asking, I need you to, I want to be a creative director. I want to be a creative director. I want to be a creative director. But they're not like doing the actual work to be a creative director. And a lot of that work, like I could give you a list of things to do. Okay, give so-and-so feedback on their thing. The Like I can give you a list of things that you have to do to be technically considered a creative director. But moving into that role means taking ownership over that role, which means you shouldn't have to be asking me anything. You should just be naturally doing that, you know, and in one job doing that does not make a creative director. It means you're on your path to being a creative director. So I would say like lean into, you know, reading the room, you know, and if you, if you do aspire to be a creative director, but you're not at a place that is like naturally, like allowing you to elevate like that, say, Hey, can I be on, on some client calls? I don't need to, I won't participate. I just want to listen. So start giving yourself an opportunity to hear more. Don't feel like you have to speak, just listen, just, and then after when the group is talking about it and they're saying like, Hey, you know, like they gave notes and this was that. And, you know, you can then engage with those notes on a different level. And if a junior artist is doing something you and you're a senior artist on it, you could be like, hey, I don't think that's what the note meant, honey. Like, 
let's work on that together before we like elevate that. You can just start naturally doing those things because that's a role you, you, you take, you're not given. And that's a big, that's a big thing that I've noticed. People that are constantly asking to be given the title haven't actually done the stuff like they've they put in time making things but they haven't put in time writing and they haven't put in time mentoring and they haven't put in time doing those other things because they weren't comfortable they wanted like you to kind of teach them how to do those things but they have to come naturally because there's a difference between um doing the thing and leading the thing they're two totally different skill sets. And one either comes naturally with a little mentorship or it doesn't come at all. And that's okay. You yeah. Know? I was going to ask. Yeah. I was going to ask, do you think that every, like creative directing is for everyone? Oh my God. Creative directing is not for everybody. Yeah. There's definitely, I'd rather pay somebody who executes a, a, as a creative director with many, many years of experience, pay them what I would pay a creative director and have them not be a creative director, then call them a creative director and kind of, it's like going from being a fish breathing water to all of a sudden being breathing air, like managing people and looking after other people's careers and listening to what a client says and wants, and then kind of bridging the gap between what your eager designer wants. Like that is, that's like hostage negotiation. That is not, <laughs> that's no longer designing and animating. That is, that's a totally different role. And it's so interesting because the best creative directors I know have like the least amount of ego, but it is that they are like this person that's elevated so high. And so typically the ones that I've met that do have so much ego and like are probably the least successful creative directors are just like the people that were really good at what they do and then go off and do the thing that they do with like a very specific team that they can really bark orders at and that they've handpicked that work in the style that they want them to work in and and it becomes very um of that person which can be okay but it's also like that's not a creative director <laughs> i mean in a way it is, but not in a like, okay, they're going to be running many jobs and have many different teams going. And, you know, this person's a little sensitive. So they're working with them in a slightly different way than they're working with this person. This client's a fucking maniac. So how are they dealing with them? And how are they protecting their team from that? You know, how so are it's they like more forced than yeah, flowing. Yeah. yeah. Way to, I'll just keep talking for an hour and you're like, two words. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like going back to like creative director, you know, cause like I've, I haven't like creative directed the client project, but I'm like art directed and closely always like working with the creative director. Right. And then like, I think like one of the pros of being a freelancer is that I got to work with like a, uh, different creative directors, mm -hmm. but I uh, totally agree with you that um, the creative directors who are so like humble and then like no ego and just like really focusing on the job and then helping me to understand what he's envisioning, what the client wants. Like that's like, like, I feel like, oh, this creative director is prepared and then oh, he's like really trusting me, you know. But as a freelancer, I feel like I learned to adapt to work with different teams and yes. different creative directors. Uh, but yeah. Well, it's interesting as a freelancer moving from art director to creative director is going to be less clear. Unless you just want to start calling yourself a creative director and... But the difference between an art director and a creative director on paper and in reality is as a creative director, you're managing the client and you're managing your team of art directors and makers like beneath you. And that could be a team of couple, but it could also be like a team of dozens. And so you're not necessarily like navigating budgets or anything like that. Cause that's probably set up before you get in the mix with when the job is bid and all of that. And you'll hopefully have a producer working alongside you that, um, see, that's the relationship that's 
not often talked about, but the creative director producer relationship is Shlomil, Shlomazel, Laverne and Shirley. They complete each other <laughs> because usually there's, you know, the, first of all, the producers talking to the producer at the agency or the client and they're talking about what all the creatives want. <laughs> So you have to like make sure your producer kind of knows what you want and you have to be strategic about how you're going to get there. Um, and so, you know, being freelance, it's hard to develop that relationship. Just, you know, because it just is, it, it, you know, that comes over times of many, many times of working with them on a job. It's not that it can't be done, but I would strongly suggest anybody looking to transition to being a freelance creative director, whenever they get their jobs, just sit down and have like an hour long conversation with the producer, get to know them, especially if it's remote, like really what's going on in your life and your family, like what's going on? Because like, here's what's going on in my life and my family, just you're going to need to know each other so that when, you know, that person's not answering an email and you can sense the producer on the other side freaking out, you can just pop in and say, oh, I know so-and-so is on a call right now, um, but I can drop these notes and, and we can get started on them. And that's not something you would, that would really be stepping out of line. Um, so that's why, but it's also like great that like you could have that pre-talk with each other and just kind of know where each other are at about like, you know, doing things like that and just having like a certain flow because that's not like I would never write back for my producer, I always like, they are the voice on the job. Um, but I will also like, after they write back, I might be like, yes. And I fully support her. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just to be like, she's not just saying this, like we obviously talked about it and I'm excited about it or, and thank you so much, blah, 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 blah. So it's really kind of developing that dynamic. That's super important. But I mean, really, just to the point of your question, if it's time for you to move on to be creative director, just put art director slash creative director on your website. Create two different rate structures for yourself. If you're going to be creative director, you're going to carry more responsibility. You're going to take less. You're obviously not going to take any other jobs while that's going on, things like that. Um, if you're creative directing a job, you might want like a longer term commitment. It might not just be like a week. Maybe it's a month. Maybe it's two months. So that you can really see a job through to completion. Um, you might want to know more about the job before you take it. You might want to meet the producer that you'll be collaborating with. Things like that. I think if, if somebody like said those things to our studio when they were coming in and saying like, Hey, I'm a creative director. You know, I'm available on freelance. Um, if we ping them to say, hey, are you available? I would ask those things and say, hey, but I'd love to have a conversation with whoever's going to be producing the job and kind of get on the you know, same page with them and really meet them. I would be to the moon and back, like to the moon and back. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I didn't have the pressure of like, oh, should I like move to create, like should I aim to be a creative director? Um, but at the moment, I think I fell in love with like uh, just like genuinely like making craft, you know, and just and yes. be good at it, you know. Um, and sometimes, like I know, like being a, in a leadership position is like a lot of responsibility, and because I know that, like I want to take that a little slower, and then mm -hmm. um, like make sure that I can like learn my craft really well like kind of like uh learning my skills better and yeah. um yeah well so you have your four client work which you're the maker on your art directing your leading teams more hands-on but then you also do some of your own projects and for those you're the director slash creative director on so mm -hmm. You know, there could be times where clients come to you directly, not through a motion design studio or not through um, an, an agency, even maybe it's just direct with client or, you know, however, where they find you because you do have such a presence out there, like people know who you are, like that, you could just start taking work that way too. How do you try and stand out when so much great work is out there now? 
Um, and I'm like really curious about it because I am such a perfectionist and I'm sure all the creatives are like that. So I feel so much pressure to um, put my work out there, especially now that I've been working. Like when I was a student, I was like pretty oblivious, like, oh, here's my work, like, you know. So, but then like as a studio owner and like just like working in the creative industry for a while, like, um, like, yeah, like how do you, what's your secret sauce? Oh God, it's so hard, right? Like for me, I try to create a place where we have a diverse client base. <laughs> so we have, um, it's all, I, I like to think high level design work. It's just some of it are for, for like pharma clients. And so you do some work, of course, to do a great job for your client, but like, you know, and to create a really great relationship with them, but it's also going to create a good living. Like you're going to make a lot of money and it's going to pay the bills and it's going to create stability. And then sometimes you chase work that is because it's beautiful. It's an art piece, like, like, um, like a conference main title. You can do whatever you want. They let you do whatever you want. Usually you can define the theme. You'll go, you'll speak about it. So that's a situation where you can get like really experimental and not have clients. You could do whatever you want, but those are self-funded. Nobody is giving you money, but you do get like all the creative control. And those are a really great way of kind of creating things to stand out, especially amongst your peers. Um, but then they're standing out for potential future clients and that work can work well too. But I found for me, the thing that tends to work the best the long term is main titles. They're highly visible. And if they're on a hit show, they become part of like the cultural conversation. You know, like when we did the title sequence for Peacemaker, you know, with that dance sequence and like the really cool type, it is all people were talking about for months and months and months. <laughs> And hopefully when Peacemaker comes back, we contribute on that as well and we level it up. Um, so for me, it's about creating work that's like highly visible out there in the world. That's, that's brief driven. So it's for clients. It's for, you know, real deal television shows and films. Now, sometimes you think you're going to do like the best title sequence and it's a good show and like it's the secret sauce and you got it like all out there but sometimes the shows just don't hit you know and for whatever reason it didn't go noticed or um maybe something happened with like the lead actor and he wound up being a gross disgusting person in the world and you can never put that on your reel again like crazy things happen you know so um, a, a lot of stars have to align for a show to become like a hit and become like, like a cultural moment. Um, and in that case, like the work needs to be really great, really good. But it, I think the context of it also is what makes it great. You know what I mean? Like, like our work on community, like that was a fun title sequence. It was a really great show. It was a, a funny show, a humor show, which often don't have like the best main titles. <laughs> you know what I mean? Usually they're kind of a little junky. And I think we did a really beautiful job, especially at the time with the CG and all that stuff. But is it like frame for frame, like a perfect piece? No, there's a million things I want to change about it. But it was the perfect idea for that show at that time. And that show was like a sleeper hit. Like it, it, it went on for a few seasons and then it kind of continued to go on. <laughs> and, and now it's like on Netflix and people love it and people talk about it all the time. And it's kind of a part of this cultural lexicon, like 10 years, 15 years later. So at the time you would have never guessed it, but. For me, it's been taking the gamble and doing those main title sequences because knowing like one in 20 is going to hit and be cool. 
Like that um, Brooklyn Nine Nine main title that we did, that cheesy one with like the frozen moments, that struck too. People like call us about that all the time, and they're like, "We saw tutorials. People like made tut- After Effects tutorials on how to recreate the <laughs> Brooklyn Nine Nine main title." It's just like a really weird, interesting thing that happens out in the world, and that was just like some like cheesy thing. I- and and was made to look not that well crafted, like on purpose. <laughs> you know, it was like intentional for the humor of it. And um, so you're like, God, that's what's gonna hit <laughs> the thing that we intentionally like. The type is kind of not right. And <laughs> it's frozen on a weird off frame, <laughs> you know. But that's I think those imperfections and like the context of it being on that show with the right music really makes it stand out. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying that you first like focus on like a client's needs and then like, and then be free, uh, be creative from that. Yeah. So like we'll get the brief or see the show and we build from that. And so we're not so much focused on like doing something in a look. Like we don't have a studio look. We like really are very brief driven and we think about what's exactly right for community, what's right for Brooklyn Nine Nine. And then we hope that the secret sauce of like it being a visible show, hitting right with the audience, all of that kind of comes together to make mm-hmm. it give it longevity, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then you're right. Like in order for the job like the work to be exposed or like um i think there is needs to be a bit of luck as well you know completely i mean think about all the things you see that are stunning Mm -hmm. i think about that all the time when i'm scrolling through instagram i'm like god that must have taken forever to make goodbye you know what i mean like oh my god i just i i guess i fear just being that was cool like i you need to see me every week when you sit down and watch your show. That I mean, that's maybe that's where my ego is, is in the visibility. Like, I don't like care about me, but like the work, like I want people to see the work and I want it to affect how they look at the next thing they look at and say, oh, well, that was not as good as that. Or us getting a call two years later to be like, hey, you know that thing you did? Can you do something like that for this, for this brand or for this thing. Cause then you can feel the work kind of spreading <laughs> and growing and becoming bigger, becoming more. That's where it brings the archival versus disposable conversation, yeah. right? Like some of the work is, is meant to just. Oh, that's cool. And then you just keep going. Or click and to purchase. Of, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Boom. I need those shoes. Yeah. 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 And then some of it is, it sticks and it sticks around, like you said, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, you watch it every, every week when the yeah. show comes out, right? Um, this is not part of the question, but now that we're talking about it, like, cause like sometimes I'm also a digital content creator, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like, do you feel like, cause like our work is like so like digital driven, like, do you feel like, oh, like, the work is gonna, it's like disposable. Like, do you find meaning behind, like, or like, how do you keep the excitement? Because sometimes when I look at the real art piece, like a painting in the museum and all that stuff, like, sometimes I wonder, like, oh, like my work is digital. Like, it's like, sometimes I feel like, oh, what if it's like meaningless, you know? I definitely don't think our work is meaningless, but I think the meaning that we've maybe prescribed to it is um, different than what it is. So most of our work is for commercial um, gain. So it is to achieve some sort of objective from our clients. So maybe it's to sell more shoes, maybe it's to gain visibility, um, maybe it's to create brand awareness, maybe it's to talk about a cause and to create a platform for people. But there's like a lot of reasons we create the things we create. And um, those are really important things. Those things historically are disposable because, you know, once they sell those shoes, they're going to want to do a new campaign for the new kind of shoe that they got out because they're going to want to, you know, 
one up where they were at and evolve where they were at. And it's, that is commerce. That is how things move. I think there was a time where commercials were more archival because there were just less of them. There were less networks. There were people spent a lot more money and labored a lot over them more. Not that the work isn't as hard to do. It's just that maybe it's a little easier to do, but it's also just, I don't know. I think ads just ran a lot longer, Austin. Am I crazy? Like, Well, I'm, I'm thinking back. I was going to say my, my, my thoughts were that I wouldn't say that the disposable nature of commercial art is is limited to digital. Because I think about one of my yeah. early mentors who, you know, print, right? Like pre-digital, I think mean, it was print or broadcast. He, I remember my mentor being like, eh, you know, people read a newspaper, there's the ad, boom, it goes in the trash. You know, it goes recycled. Well, back then in the trash. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully not. So I, I think it it's... It's pretty disposable by its nature of. But I don't think it's digital art. I think a digital is, is just a medium, you know? Yeah, exactly. I think, I mean, maybe it's, it's, everything is a bit faster, right? And there's more, and there's more of it and there's more platforms. So maybe it is the speed of, of how disposable it is. Maybe it's picked up, but, but I think, um, you know, it, it's, Graphic design, in it, by its nature, if it's done in a commercial context, is often, yeah, it, it turns over. And I think about, you know, a lot of the client work I do that, even, you know, if it's retail or fashion, it, it is it's seasonal, right? It yeah. does change. But then you think of, I think about a piece like the I, I Love New York, the I Heart New York by like yeah. Milton Glaser. Like sometimes things become real archival. Like, yeah. oh, yeah. And I think it's going back to what we were discussing earlier. A lot mm-hmm. sometimes it's just luck. It's the right, the right piece at the right time, and it hits the nerve, and it and it sticks. Absolutely. You know? yeah. yeah, but I so but I don't think that's. Um, I think print and that like painting. I think it's all digital art. To me, it's all art. You know what I mean. I, I don't feel like that there's anything more or less disposable. I think like what it's for, maybe. Yeah, the intention is what just, makes it last you know, or just, not. And a point, lot of it isn't meant to last. So the, the point I wanted to make is that as an industry, we made things a little more archival. It's this like newer generation of the industry. And I just think about this all the time because like on our website, we don't have all of our work. Um we don't even have all of our like really great portfolio work that we show as we keep our site pretty trimmed down to just the stuff we want to show very strategically. Um, and our, com- and you know, our competitors do the same, but it, I, I like think a lot about like the early days, like when we were coming up, like, we put everything on our websites. We put like our archive of content, like of the things that we made on our website. And like, you know, that if you were looking for that Bombay Sapphire spot that Psyop did, you could go to their website and it would have it. But like, first of all, psyop has been around forever. There's no way that that spot is on their website. Maybe, but like, probably not. Right. Like brand new school. Think about all the stuff brand new school did back in the day. There's no way any of that stuff is on their website because like it doesn't necessarily represent them right now in mm. this moment. So like where is all of like the, I mean Stash did a pretty good job but they're like a little less visible these days, but they used to have this DVD and they still do, you know, like kind of like how Art of the Title does their top 10. They do like their top spots of the year. But there, there was something special about getting that DVD and being included on the DVD. And it was like, it like made the stuff for us archival. And I think like with Motionographer where it's at and just like, there's just like no spot anymore where things are like, wow, my stuff's in that, you know? And like us as companies, we've kind of like allowed that to kind of fizzle out for just like what's hot that day, what's What's trending, you know? Kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only other thing that makes me think about bringing it back to like just 
the the intention of like what yeah. what goes into an installation or a museum or you know like mm-hmm. that's the intention is just really different I think you know I mean mm-hmm. and I do know that like MoMA they 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 showcase like really mm-hmm. you know breakthrough pieces of design you know but it's I don't think it's necessarily what what the purpose is a lot of the time. Yeah. Right? It's help move messages. Yeah. You know? And persuade people to buy things, <laughs> do things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question would be overcoming stereotypes that, you know, like while communicating with uh, male co workers. And I'm sure, I mean, like you're a studio owner, so. Uh, it's probably different, but could you, like, would you be able to, ex- like, share the experience when you are a staff, um, uh, in, like, um, you know, and then, like, moving to the director, and then how do you communicate with them, like, and then before, kind of, like, in comparison? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a, this is an interesting one, um, overcoming stereotypes while communicating with male coworkers. So I don't, I didn't really give much thought to this as I was kind of coming up in the industry. Um, and when I look back on that, that was probably, I wish I was more self-aware <laughs> because I would have worked harder at it. I think I was pretty dismissive when I was dismissed, you know? Um, yeah. So like, I didn't really put a lot of effort into like joining their their hobbies and their kind of outings. Like they would play video games together and I was not interested in that. They go maybe go paintballing and I was just like not interested in that. And I just, um, I don't know. I don't know that I would do anything different, but I think I would have maybe like tried to make more of an effort connecting with them, like in a group mentality. I think I was always more focused on -on one-on-one. And in general, I think I'm better one-on-one, but I think guys like they called them Mo Bros for a reason. It's because they like kind of traveled in packs. And I think like being outside of the pack definitely um, did not help with, you know, furthering my career, although I did okay, but I certainly not at those places. I was always for sure an outsider. Um, and you know, like I never had a female boss, so I've, well, not in motion design anyway, certainly like coming from, you know, uh, having other types of jobs, but never in motion design. I never had a female um, creative lead or female boss or any kind of woman in <laughs> any kind of seniority, um, like around me. So it was, uh, I guess it was pretty lonely and I didn't really have a person to ask like, Hey, is this weird or not? Right. But I did, you know, once have a boss listen in on a call I had with, um, with a client, I was leading a job and they listened into the call. And after the call, they said I did a really good job. Um, But then I did this thing with my voice where at the end of the sentence, my voice would go up, which made me sound like a little girl asking her daddy for permission. And, you know, I don't remember a lot. (laughs) Like I have like a very gauzy type memory, but I remember that. And I just remember being like, oh, yeah, th- thank you for the feedback. Like, one, I was surprised they listened in on the call without letting me know, let alone asking my permission, but, like, letting me know. Um, and then second, I was very surprised to be getting feedback like that because I remember thinking, like, well, isn't it a good thing <laughs> to, like, doing that with my voice? Like, asking, you know, a client what they think with my inflection. Like, why is that a bad thing? Um, and then, like, wow, how dare this person, how dare he say that I sounded like a little girl asking daddy for permission. It was a female client. (laughs) Perhaps this was like a good learning moment for him to kind of maybe see how it was done. 
to have empathy for a client and to ask, but I was not old enough and I definitely wasn't empowered enough to say anything. Um, and so I think for me, where that leads me now is to just say, like, I just try to be really open minded with my team and, and try not to step out of bounds in any way. And I'm, um, just more mindful, you know, um, and try and create for space for others <laughs> that aren't, that don't look and talk and walk and do all the things like I do, you know. Um, and I have to say, it's really interesting having this group of people. Like I look around and I see all these guys, I like, yeah, like these typical white guys, right? Like that are so talented in their craft, but they have a lady boss, you know, they got a lady that can come over their shoulder and like just kind of nitpick at what they're working on. And that takes a special kind of guy. You know what I mean? And I just feel really grateful that they're, has been so much evolution because I just, I think like, like I have kind of what I've always wanted to be a creative lead, but I think I had to create my own place to attract the right kind of people that could be by a woman. Right. Like if you take that step back, like I was never going to have that at that place. And I did not realize it. I always, I would, I would always think like, God, did they like miss out? But then because I could have done all of this here for them. I could have made all of this for them. And I would have been so happy to do that. But I think the real reality is, is I couldn't because they couldn't handle it. And the people they attracted toward their organization could not take leader, could not take having a woman leader within that organization because of who they attracted in and like the, like the bravado that, was like running through the organization and was obviously, you know, uh, supported and encouraged, you know, if not directly, obviously, what is, what is that saying? It's not overtly. Yeah. Not overtly. Like, I don't think they would ever see themselves as being a sexist organization, but it was in, in, implicit, right. Not explicit, but yeah. Right. And I, I hope, like, I wish now I look back at that and I wish I would have just been like, okay, so I guess I quit. Fuck you. Like, also, like, from my lawyer for saying that shit to me, um, in addition to other things. But um, that's just, like, not how I was wired. It took me, like, a long time after that to, like, really see what I was dealing with. And once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it and I left. I was just like, oh, bounce. You know what I mean? And I think... That's, you know, in terms of overcoming stereotypes and communicating, like, I feel like the bigger thing is, is if you feel like you can't pack up your shit as quickly as possible and go, it just might not be your people. You know what I mean? And if they're not your people, like, why are you giving them your time and talent? You know, I'm not certainly advocating like you just up and quit your fucking job, like get yourself set up, build your real, do what you need to do, start looking. But just like get this idea out of your head that this is your forever place because it is not your forever place. How can a male educator help empower you know, female design students? Yeah, get them used to talking. And that, right on. And another thing to do try to be like a good listener, you know, like try to like, because I think because you've never lived in female body and then you've been living your whole life as male. Right. So like, sometimes I think it's better to just like, listen to them, you know, like giving them a space to be, uh, to talk, you know, and then, and then like, understand and then like learning you know like i'm here to also like learn you know through what you're saying and i also say to my brother that um yeah like if you really want to understand female or like that's like that's not like male you know like experience different um just like just give them more space and then you know 
talk more like what Erin says. Because yeah. through through their speech or through their um, conversation, you get more information. And um, yeah, to add or to that, I think is you know some women for sure don't have a problem talking. <laughs> You know, that's, but I think, you know, uh, for others, they don't necessarily um, feel, it's more like talking on top of somebody, which you'd never want to talk on top of somebody, but it's um, respectfully disagreeing or yeah, budding, you know what I mean? I feel like it would be also to give like contrasting just thoughts and ephem- like ideas around the thing. I, I just, I feel like we're so used to saying, um, just agreeing to like make it easier for people. I also like a thing I did and try very hard not to do is to like apologize before I like give what I know is going to be hard feedback. So like if, if you kind of, kind of sense somebody doing that like it's not good to mansplain but if somebody's like oh sorry i you know but i was uh, oh you don't have to apologize for having an opinion you can just have your opinion i think it's okay to like kind of especially as an educator let somebody know like there's nothing to be apologetic about you're here to express your thoughts and opinions please do so we are curious Mm -hmm. you know so it's like finding those little things that like we do to kind of ease ease everybody else because <laughs> we're about to speak you know i think you can say oh you don't have to apologize for you know like apologize for being late don't apologize for having a thought when i just ask you your opinion you know so things like that Kind of crazy, right? It's kind of crazy. I was thinking the other day I was doing it. I was like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Like, but like, I don't know. I just kind of prefer, you know, and I'm like, Oh, I'm not sorry. Like, that's my job is to have an opinion and to share it with you. (laughs) Thank you for asking me my opinion. My opinion is thus, you know, (laughs) it should be more that, you know, thank you for doing your job so I could do my job. Yeah. Um, in Sorry. that sense, like, I'm, like, really glad that I was able to experience, like, different culture during mm-hmm. my 20s because I just, like, had no idea, like, like, someone, like, when I was, like, applying internships, like, someone replied that, oh, you look like um, some actresses, you know, or, like, just, like, really inappropriate when I was in my early 20s. Wow. And now that I'm, like, thinking back, I'm, like, that was like so inappropriate, but I didn't even catch that, you know? Right. No. Because I was just so oblivious. Yeah. Or like someone says, I don't know, like my, I, I'm not a good, like, I'm not really good at like recalling old memories, but I do remember a couple of things that there are now that I think about it, that was really inappropriate, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so when I was like start, when I was like working at, uh, at, internship or like a studio like I was I was just like habitually saying oh I'm so sorry because like I was afraid that I would make mistake or like um not um not make the work like easier um but I've seen like how like white female uh like react to the same like a certain environment or situation or like 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 Latin females or like yeah yeah. So, yeah. So different. Yeah. Yeah. They were so different, but I was able to experience and then saw it really closely. And, um, I was also living with two Latina girls back in Savannah, um, Gretel and Nabila. Um, and then they're like, no, Sophie, you don't know. You have to say it. Like, like they were very confident and they right. were like not even like hesitate to say things that I felt like, oh, I'm not sure if I can say it, but they're like, no, you have to say. It. So, you know, um, and I think those like experiences really helped me to be independent, like working independently. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can totally understand that some people have been a really hard time to, you know, um, like communicating with males or, you okay. know, especially at work. Um, 
or even at school, you know, um, I had a bit of hard time like presenting the class at school. So my voice would be like almost like mosquito, you know, you know, you, you can barely hear what I'm saying. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So I think those experiences were. I think another like trait is like guys don't hesitate to talk over you. Like you could be talking and then all of a sudden the guy, you know, can insert and just kind of like, just like rail, rail, like railroad right over you. And I think Austin, like you can't like, ne- like stop that from happening. But what you can do is say like, okay, well, I don't think Teresa was done speaking. So we're going back to her. Mm. So it, it's like an opportunity to be like, okay, you've made your point, but now let's go back to the actual person that had the fucking table. And that's a good opportunity for both people to kind of learn like decorum a little bit. Yeah. No, I've actually had to do that. I've had to do that on occasion. You know, I've gotten better at it too. Yeah. It's it's hard in the moment to catch these things. It's so, so hard because you're there to teach design. You're not there to teach like people how to necessarily treat each other. But that does get into a professional practices kind of paradigm and also right. just like a, a way of like operating your your space around you. Um, and in our studio, like we've had to talk to a few people a couple of times, like, hey, you gotta like, you know, you're excited, but like, it's real dismissive when you do that. Like, <laughs> you gotta chill. Right. And it's hard to have those conversations, but you absolutely have to. You absolutely have to. No, it's tough because sometimes it is. It's sometimes it's the person's just excited and they're used yeah. to jumping in. And you don't want to like squash them, yeah. but you do want to be like, hey, like so-and-so was talking, so <laughs> let them finish. Let them finish. Yeah. And I've seen it and I've actually done I've done that. And then I've seen that person where those people will actually catch themselves and let other people go yeah so yeah, yeah. it is and being of service you are yeah. one of those people that just like has an idea and they like can't wait to get it out because i actually do cut people off when they're talking and i've had to learn to stop doing that um, which is so not a female trait but i it is super rude um, and I hope I, people realize I'm doing it out of excitement as like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just like, but I'll, I'll always have paper and pen and like, cause I'm always also worried I'm going to forget what I, this brilliant, brilliant thing that I was going to say. And I'll start writing it down. I'll write it down. And you realize like, had you just waited a breath, that person was getting there. Like, Anyway, and then you go, yeah, as you were talking, I was thinking exactly the same thing. And then it's a different way of connecting with the person or, or, oh, like, oh, wow, you went there, but I was going to go left. Like, but you inspired this idea. You know what I mean? Like, it's just nice. So I always, I do always keep pen and paper just so that like, I can help kind of control that talking over people impulse. Yeah. I'm really learning a lot through this conversation because (laughs) This is because like this, I've been drawing so much for the past five years that I'm really like trying to learn other side of life. And, um, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say like in a really honest way that I really lack of these skills or like understanding, you know, because my life focus has been so much about growing career and getting a job and just like keep continuing that. Um, so this is like so valid and um just being you know um um understanding where this person is coming from you know and some and also have to make sure that i'm not giving too much uh attention so that they would feel also uh like that's too much you know so um but i also have to read that in the room like what's the vibe what's this person like um like am i too much like showing the energy or you know so it's really hard you know um it is a lot of reading the room yeah it is a lot of reading the room and that gets into like the skills of a creative director versus like like i just need to make the thing i don't want to have to deal with all these crazy people i think that that happens a lot i mean i think i of course it happens as an educator. Like I yeah. have to do that constantly, but it is, it's, it is that. I mean, and it's funny because as, as you guys are talking, I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm totally, I call it like being a blurter. I blurt. 
You know, I get excited and I blurt, you know, and I've gotten much better at it. But when you're the, when you're the professor, like, you know, nobody's going to stop me from blurting, right? I have to be the one to do it. But, you know, I like discussions. I like, and sometimes it's, there's so many different personalities and there's the person that's like, okay, like you've said enough, like, let's go to the next person. And the next person who's just done, says two words and it's like, can you say a little more or like, could you please speak up? And I, and I, I think I've learned how to do that in a way that's, you know, just trying to help, not shame yeah. anybody, but yeah, to be playful and they keep it as just part of that process. Mm-hmm. But it is like, and, and, and to some extent, I guess modeling it, you know, modeling what we're looking for in a discussion and, and hearing people's thoughts and, and, uh, yeah. How to develop an accurate sense of self, like which is like metacognition. And I'm sure, as a creative director, when you are like looking for resources, like you uh, are like constantly going through different portfolios, and I'm sure you can tell, like, uh, like can this person really do this, or like, uh, or is it this just some portfolio? Like, what is going on? Like, yeah. So. Um, and I think this could be a really helpful for like junior designer or like students, you know, like just be true with their skills, although it could be a scary thing, you know, like just like be honest about what you're capable of and what you're not. So I thought I would bring up this topic like medical teaching and um, how you could, how we could like be true with our skills and what we are capable of. So that's for like an artist sharing their portfolio, how they can. So like if I'm a a junior designer, I'm not coming in thinking that I'm a creative director or explain this to me a little bit more. Yeah. So basically like how to develop an accurate sense of self, like for a junior design, junior mm-hmm. designer or like a student, because as I'm going senior, I think I know what I'm capable of and what I'm not. But yes. when I was like student and when I was just starting my career, like I felt like, oh, I know how to make this pretty, but within the timeline, I'm not really sure, you know, so like that's not accurate. So like, how would you advise? Yeah, so that's an interesting thing because I think that seniority has less to do with talent than it does to ha- than it does to do with experience, <laughs> and I think it leans into this idea of metacognition. I love the title um, because so like when you're a junior artist, like you'll know you'll get there. Like you have confidence in your skills, and you know you can create and make things. Um, but you don't necessarily know that it's going to take you a week to do it and not four hours, which is what you have. And you don't necessarily know that you're going to have to watch like six tutorials and ask all the people around you for tips and tricks on how to get there um, on your path to get there. You have the confidence to do it. You know, you have the skills to get there, but you don't necessarily have, like the understanding of what it's fully going to take. Um, and so as you get experience and you go through these things over and over and over again, and you start realizing like, oh, this, you know, takes this and is going to require that. And, and then you start mentoring other people and saying like, oh, here, like, why don't just start the journey here? When you get to this point, I'll show you what to do. Like once you start breaking it down for then in, into like kind of teacher mode and mentor mode, like you just get more self-aware, like you have conversations with your creative leads and your producers where you're like, okay, I can get you this by noon, but all of those versions, like that's going to take a whole day. Like don't promise that to the client because I'm going to have to check the renders. Like there's going to, we've been having an issue with the farm and like something's up with this, blah, blah, blah. They're going to know like all these little things that like, only a person that has been through it a million times in the environment is going to know, you know, and that, that only comes from experience. Mm. There are some things you can only learn with experience that talent has absolutely nothing to do with. Right. 
Like I have senior producers here that just know what it's going to take and they've never done it, but they have, they've watched it be done by like, you know, 15 junior people a million times and 15 senior people a million times. And like, what if this one person that just knows what they're doing does it? Oh, then I could have it done in a day for you. They just know because that's the difference between a senior producer and an associate producer just starting out in their career. And that's why like it really grinds my gears, which is one of my favorite sayings, grinds my gears, when you have a young person come in that's a junior designer and in a year they wanna be a senior designer. That's just not possible. <laughs> it's just not because you couldn't have worked the hours it's gonna take if I worked you day and night for a full year, there is no way you could be a senior designer. Yes, your design is good. Yes, you are talented, but you are not a senior designer because I cannot trust you to tell me how long things are going to take and to communicate with your collaborators and to save your files where they need to be saved. And there's all these other things that go along with being a senior artist that has to do. And even if you do everything great, you've only done it for a year. You are not a senior designer. It's so hard, I think, for people that, you know, are used to like leveling up so quickly and moving through the ranks and, and learning so fast that they come into the world and things go into slow motion a little bit. <laughs> and you're like, but that's really what it is. Like, it just takes time and experience of going through it and doing it a million times right and also a few times wrong. Because those wrong ones are going to teach you a lot more than the right ones are going to teach you. Maybe more than a few. Well, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, if they're those, those things that you fuck up, you're never going to forget. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I and think I could. Important. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I think I could speak to this a little bit too. Like this idea, this sense of like accurate. Really, it's an, a sense of appraisal across a couple different areas, right? Whether it's scope. Right. Like just being able to look at a brief and assess like, okay, what's going into this? Like what exactly needs to happen mm -hmm. here? And I see it from, from the students, from like even an introductory level class where, and I've gotten, we really dial it into like, okay, we're going to real bite size exercises where it's just like a very small ask in a short amount of time. And, and then, and then slowly over time, they, they start developing a sense of like, oh, how long it's actually going to take? Cause they get a huge idea and it's just like, yeah, that, that's not going to happen. And it, you right. And in, in the amount of time that I'm giving you. Right. And then in terms of like profession, and that's where, where students graduating into the workforce were. I, I'm like, look, you got to make enough money to eat and to live and, and to not be taken advantage of. But I'm like, don't, it's okay to have a junior rate to start out. What that means is that you've got junior expectations and that's a lot less pressure. Now, I know for me, I can speak from my experience. I put way more, pr like, I didn't have that sense. I like had senior expectations of myself when I was really a junior artist and, and, and I put way too much responsibility on myself and I get too stressed. And, and I think I did myself somewhat of a disservice, although that helped me later to be able to go, Oh, you know, when you're a junior. It's okay to be a junior. <laughs> right. And then, and it took just, you know, to a a a echo what Aaron said, it, it's years and years of practice that I'm able to like, and I also know when a client, I mean, when a client comes and says, Hey, I have a project. What's it going to cost? Build an estimate. I'm like, well, I need, there's some information I need. I need to know, like, what is it that you're asking for? How, what's the length? What's the aesthetic? Like early on, I didn't even know I needed all those things. Like I didn't have that list of. Well, I can't tell you accurately unless you give me certain information. I was just kind of like, okay, we'll figure it out. And, and that's probably where a lot of my, um, mistakes <laughs> and stress came from. Right. But it is, um, yeah, perspective comes from experience and from doing it a lot, a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. That was like really good question. Um, 
Yeah, so like I think we can move into the general. That was funny. Good job, Sophie. Good question. <laughs> we agree. It was a great question. <laughs> I feel like we're learning a lot about you from your questions. Your questions oh, really? were so insightful. Yes. Oh, well, you're very. I'll tell you what. Sophie was a student who would. You know, I'd be like, okay, we're going to do ideation exercises and we're going to like, I'm just trying to get the students to do some free writing and maybe do a little writing and make a mind map and then do a mood board. Sophie's like, I researched like four scholarly articles and I've cross-referenced them. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa. All right. All right. Talk about taking no, but, serious. You know what? Like. The more I'm working in the industry, like besides drawing and making work, like there are things that I'm starting to finding out about myself is that I am really curious about people. Yeah. You know? That's good. And then, yeah, like I'm really curious about people. So I've, I'm trying to like take advantage of this time to get to yeah, know Erin, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, this is like really valid. Again, like it's so unique, you know? And I would really love to see more, um, female lead in our industry, like more and more. Um, so I'm like, just like really trying to, uh, you know. Squeeze it, squeeze all the juice out of the lemon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and this yeah. is just through my experience. Like I, there's no right or wrong to any of this. There's just, you know, there's plenty of ways to do something. Aaron said that you went through a recession. Multiple. <laughs> Multiple times. <laughs> first one, two, 9-11. That was the first. That was a bad mm. one, right? Uh, then the housing crash, 08, 09. Oh, there was then we stuff. had a little thing called the pandemic. <laughs> right? Here we are. And I think we're sort of maybe there's something happening right now, it seems like. That, seems who like knows? This. Uh, some uncertainty uh, yeah. in the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, interest rates are going way up, and uh, that's a sign that things are. Well, there's many. I'm not an economist <laughs> again. I might read. Well, the we economist. just hear. We see the ripples, right? Things well, happen. You can feel it. You can see things happening. Waves. I mean, just look what's happening in tech. That's all you need to see, and in, in banking. Yeah. Anyway. Generalist versus specialist. And I, I think it would be really great if you could uh, advise for junior designer and for seniors. Because right. I think, I feel like for me, every three years, I was like desiring to, okay, what's the next step? Like kind of like thinking about that moment. So yeah. um, I think it would be great to hear that from you. Well, I think from the studio owner perspective, we prefer generalists. We love a strong designer, graphic designer that knows how to animate um, for sure 2D. Um, it would be great if they did not fear 3D, if they were willing to play around in it and get into it because everything is kind of like an amalgamation of all the things. So from an employability perspective, from that like kind of career trajectory, traditional career trajectory of like designer, animator, senior, this, that, creative director, blah, blah, blah. Generalist feels like generally <laughs> the way it goes. Now there are a few rare occasions where I would say that person is a specialist at heart. And that's when it's like, they use their art as, um, you know, where their art is just it, every once in a while, there's a brief out there that their art will satisfy and like make the brief just sing, you know? And I feel like those are the moments like we like crave working with the specialist, the person that can do this thing. And only this one person can do the thing and they agreed to do it with us. And we're going to learn so much about them and their process. And it's going to not just be like a job, but like an experience. And it's going to be awesome. And there's going to be collaboration and learning and all that. So um, the problem is, is that there's less jobs for the specialist, like historically in a, in the studio like mine. So I can't necessarily have them on full time. 
unless they want to work as a generalist and then every once in a while I can sell through something that's like a specialist kind of thing that they do only. Um, but I do think like the world has gotten a lot smaller with the internet, with the ability to market oneself. So I would say if somebody has specialist tendencies that has like a unique point of view that that only they can do or has a handle on software, like if they're like a Houdini expert that does this one kind of blue fire, you know, like go forth because you know, there's, there's just not a lot of people like that. And if that's the thing that you, you do, like go do it and, and make sure you're also marketing yourself and not just doing the thing in a vacuum, but like doing the thing and like getting it out there and putting it out there and being a bit of a self promoter so that you can be consistently working if you want to be or selling. Um, yeah, like, so, like, I'm a generalist that perhaps wishes they had been a specialist. <laughs> um, and then I'm sure there are specialists that, of course, wish they were more generalized so that they had more different opportunities. But, yeah, I, I think uh, there's always, like, moments of grass is greener. It's lovely when a specialist has a little bit of flexibility. They aren't such an artiste especially if they're in the commercial world. Because like I said, like there's like a lot of no's, you know, no's meaning notes, you know, like they're not necessarily bad things either. Notes, notes can actually inform the process and make it better. But if you come in with the mentality of like, I'm the specialist, I know this is, let me do the thing I know how to do, but then also assume that the client doesn't know their product and their audience. That's like, again, very close minded and different. So like, I think like the beauty happens when like both of those kind of people meet and there's uh, just sharing, sharing of information like, hey, like, but actually like our clients are a little bit older and oh, interesting. Then let me or our clients all seem to have, you know, triplets and kids and you know, because they're having kids older with like, well, anyway, so then you could like your illustrations can start to represent that and it can be like even more imp impactful. To me, I feel like motion design itself is somewhat of a generalist discipline just because it is like lots of different disciplines overlapping. I also think the human species is really generalist, like anthropology wise, you know, we're very much this scrappy, like scavenger, hunter gatherer, like I, through evolution and that there were other uh, hominid like cousins that were very specialized that aren't here anymore. So I think that that lesson is that as the environment changes, as the industry and media landscape changes, generalists do pretty well at adapting. Mm -hmm. Having said all that, it's, I feel like it would be cruel to force someone who's not a generalist to try to be that, right? Like if you're a specialist, be a specialist. If you're a generalist, be a generalist. Like you got to be who you are. Um, I as think for myself, yeah. To force that, I'm seeing I'm talking over you. But as somebody Sorry. that's tried to kind of force a, a move like that to be like, okay, they're really good at this. So like if we, if we just kind of give them other stuff, they'll be okay. Like, because when they do this thing, they're really good at this thing. Like it does not work. <laughs> right. And I think that like, gen like specialists tend to go more into like VFX because I think they do really well there because it's focused yeah. and, or like, like one or single style illustrators, you know what I mean? Like go deep into that. Like to me, those are, are specialists. All right. So should we, should we wrap so it? Lovely. Yeah. This has been amazing. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time. I know it's getting late over there. Um, yeah, but this was like really helpful and hopefully the audiences um, have like the same um, opinion about our podcast. Yeah, well, we can ask them and they can tell us. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. appreciate you sharing your time. It's always it's always fun to get to get to hang out and talk to an alum and really always, uh, I think for me, it's always gratifying too, to see, see all out there in the world doing your thing. And, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Makes, uh, I don't know. What am I, what am I trying to say right now? I don't know. I'm, proud that I'm proud. I think I'm trying to give like praise. I've realized I've, I tried to do this the other day in class. I tried to give the students praise. I was like, I'm not good at 
given uh, praise. Uh, so you're just going to have to bear with me. But no, I'm very, very proud and, and glad to see you out in the world and succeed. And, and yeah. yeah, thank you yeah. for sharing your time with us. Of yeah, course, that was all like, really yeah. thoughtful questions there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully I could reach out to you again individually, Erin. Oh, yeah. Um, and like when I visit the States, I would love to. Yeah. Yes. Or like in a conference, you know. Um, yes. Yeah. And if I'm ever cool. over there, even close to South Korea, I will stop by. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 please. Yeah. Let's do a road trip. Let's do a road trip to South Korea. Let's do Aaron. a road trip to South Korea. <laughs> yeah. Sure, we can. We'll so figure it out. I am confident. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this was like awesome. And how do we how do we wrap this up? Do we have okay, any so we, say peace. we do a peace sign. This, this is Austin's vibe right here. Yeah. And then we say thank you and goodbye. Thanks for listening and see you on the next Between the Keyframes.